Good morning, welcome to another day of Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. My topic this morning is understanding the power of addiction. Uh, I'm in a, in a series uh, over the last few days that I've entitled The Subtle Power of Addiction. The Subtle Power of Addiction. And uh, my topic today is understand its power and be wise. So the series is The Subtle Power of Addiction. Today's topic is understand its power and be wise. It's been a few days since I've been on. Been busy taking care of some personal stuff as well as uh, some traveling. My wife and I had the pleasure of going to a marriage retreat over the weekend. Uh, really, really good. Uh, any of you that, um, if you ever hear about uh, Family Life's Weekend to Remember and you have a chance to be able to attend that, uh, I would encourage you to take advantage of it. The three days were definitely worth it. At the end of that, every uh, couple renewed their vows and uh, their commitments to each other, and uh, it was a really, really uh, moving experience. And so I've been a little bit busy, had some personal things to deal with over the last few days, so I've not been on in the mornings like I would like to, but I wanted to get back on today and, and continue this topic of the subtle power of addiction, the subtle power of addiction. Uh, if you have missed the previous uh, sessions or broadcasts that I've done, I'm going to encourage you to check out Live Recession Proof Now Facebook page, or uh, some of these were recorded on my personal page, and at some point over the next few days, I'll have them added to YouTube. And so anything that I record, uh, on Facebook, I at some point try to upload on YouTube, but I want to deal with this topic of addiction. It is a big topic. It's an important topic, and um, it's a it's a often misunderstood topic. And so today, I want to again deal with my topic. Today is understand the power of addiction, or the subtlety of addiction, and be wise. And the fact that my series title is called The Subtle Power of Addiction. By implication, I'm saying that we all have addictions in our life that we may not be aware of them. And I'm thinking now of negative or sinful, bad or evil addictions, though we've made the point that as far as the Bible is concerned, all addictions are not bad. All addictions are not bad addictions. All right, so a quick recap on what we've covered so far. Um, one, I've sought to make the point that everyone, every human being, at least at a certain age, I don't know about little children, but at least at a certain age, once we are consciously making choices, I think each one of us have an addiction somewhere. Now, somehow over the last hundred years, in society's effort to deal with drug addiction and alcoholism, which have been outlawed, in Britain and the United States a little over 100 years as illegal activity, the word addiction has taken on the meaning where it's only seen as a negative. And so what I've sought to do is take it out of the realm that addictions are only negative and put the word in the realm that it should be in because the Latin word for addict means to be devoted. And I said to those of you that had joined me in previous uh, lessons, that addiction in scripture is often associated with one, idolatry. We're talking about sinful, bad, and evil addictions. They're often associated with idolatry. And secondly, I said that addiction is misdirected devotion. The Latin word for addiction is to be devoted. It's actually to devote yourself and over time, using scripture as an example, the thing that we yield ourselves to, the person that we yield ourselves to, we eventually become a slave to. This is the language of Romans chapter 6. To whom ye yield yourselves as servants, to be servants, as servants, uh, to, to that thing or person you become a servant. Right? Jesus says in John chapter 8 that he that committed sin is a servant or slave to sin. So, the first point, the first three points that we've made is number one, generally in scripture, 
that the word addict when used or addiction when used in a negative sense it's associated with being uh, with with idolatry so there is something or someone that's in my life or your life that's more important to us than God himself that's idolatry secondly we said it's misdirected devotion it's misdirected devotion we are to love the Lord our God, the scripture, the scripture says, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And Satan, the world, and the flesh does all that it can to dullen our consciences, destroy the power of our resolves, our willpower, to blind our hearts so that like Eve, we become deceived to choose things that are bad or that are evil or that are not good for us or that can be enslaving, we then see those things as pleasurable. And we have a tendency to be a slave to the moment, to be controlled by the moment. In the moment, I have the promise of dopamine or certain types of pleasure because of pornography, because of adultery, because of... of um, alcohol because of nicotine drugs there is a promise being given to the mind given to the heart that it has a subtlety to it a craftiness to it that like Eve you and I look at these things and we see that quote unquote they are good for food or able to make us wise when something is good for food it is satisfying when Eve saw that the tree was good for food when she saw that it provided sustenance when she saw that it could feed her, she then believed the lie that she should live on bread alone and not on the word of God. And so in the same way, understanding how Satan works, how the world is structured, its system, and how the flesh, under the control of the evil one and the world, how the flesh functions, there's nothing new under the sun. The methodology that's used is exactly the same and the enslaving power is the same and we've set out I've set out to make the point that if you're going to deal with addiction number one you need to first you, you have to be able to understand that not all addictions are sinful and that addiction has a very subtle and craftiness to it and so the text that we use we used a couple texts of scripture number one uh, the text I used was Hosea chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And in Hosea 4, verse 11, the scripture says, uh, Whoredom, wine, and new wine takes away the heart. Whoredom, wine, and new wine taketh away the heart. The idea of the heart being taken away, it depletes us of strength. And so God says that these three things, as he was speaking to the Israelites through the prophet Hosea, whoredom, which is any type of sexual promiscuity, sexual sin, masturbation, pornography, fill in the blank, these things have the ability to take away the heart. They take away the strength. They take away the ability to say no. There are many things that have enslaving power, but these three things are some of the most subtle and the most deceptive as far as Hosea is concerned. Hortum, wine, and new wine. So we made the point that that was point number one. Second thing we looked at was 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13 where we're told about the house of Stephanus or Stephanus that they had addicted themselves to ministry. They had addicted themselves to ministry. And the authorized version translators or the King James translators understood that the word addiction is not always a bad word because the, the house of Stephanus had addicted themselves to ministry. And the point we sought to make there is that addiction is a choice. It doesn't end as a choice it begins as a choice it starts as a choice the Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 13 that uh, in 14 it says that lust when it is conceived brings forth sin so temptation in and of itself is not sin just because I am tempted just because you and I are tempted 
to gamble, tempted to do something, you fill in the blank, that's sinful or wrong. That in and of itself is not sin. And so in the choice, there's no sin in the choice itself, or in the, the temptation to make the choice, is, would be better said. The temptation itself is not sin. It is when we entertain that sin and we choose to act on that temptation or that desire that it becomes sin. And so the point that I sought to make over the last two lessons is that addiction begins as a choice. The, the, um, the people that Paul referred to here in uh, Corinthians chapter 16, he said they had addicted themselves to ministry. They had chose to devote themselves to ministry. And as, I, as we look at how to deal with addictions of any kind, namely sinful addictions, evil addictions, bad addictions, um, I will give what I believe are four principles from Scripture on how to deal with any addiction in general. Uh, and this is more for the child of God. Um, so what I want to do today is spend just a few minutes talking about the need for us to understand the power of addiction and be wise. And what gives power to to this idea of addiction, thinking of negative addictions here, is keep thinking now of addiction as misdirected dependence, misdirected dependence, and devotion. Okay? I could be addicted to all sorts of things. You could be addicted to all sorts of things. Ideally, we want to be addicted to the Lord. We want to be addicted to the Word of God. We want to be addicted to the things of God. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church and he reminds them of what happened to Eve in the garden. And he says that, that um, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, right, beguiled Eve, how did he beguile her? Through his subtlety through his subtlety, through his craftiness, right? That's through his wiles. The devil, where his power comes from, the devil's power comes from deception. The power of the devil comes through subtlety, comes through craftiness. The devil is very wise and crafty in making and convincing us that things that are evil, things that are bad for us, things that are sinful are actually good for us. And I made a statement that I'm going to try to remember uh, in, I think, the second lesson. And it was this, that Eve did not choose the bad because she lacked the power to choose the good. Eve chose the bad because she believed that the bad was good. If you understand this principle, if I understand this principle, it changes the way we deal with besetting sin, the way we deal with sins that may seek to dominate our lives, the way we deal with things, bad habits and things that control us. Let me say it again. Eve did not choose to eat the forbidden fruit because she lacked the power to choose the right fruit. Eve chose the bad fruit because Eve believed that choosing the bad fruit was good. That's what makes bad, sinful, evil addictions subtle and dangerous. Because the person who is tempted to choose something that is bad for them usually is believing a false promise. They're believing either that I have the power to be able to resist over time. Maybe they're believing I can stop this whenever I want to. Maybe they're believing I'm not really controlled by this thing. Maybe they're believing it's not really that bad. Either way, it's a beguiling it is a subtle work of Satan to deceive us into believing that we can be children of God, not obey God, and still get to heaven. Let me say that again. 
There is lots of teaching about positional righteousness. It's an important doctrine. We're not righteous by our own works. We're righteous because of what Christ did on the cross. But sometimes we so emphasize positional righteousness that we negate or neglect the scriptures, tons of them, that, that, that emphasize and require practical righteousness. In other words, that if I, have, if I am positionally righteous, it will be seen in my practical everyday living. But if I believe I can live in sin, as I used to believe, I used to, I used to believe that I was so, quote-unquote, eternally secure that I could actually disobey God intention, intentionally, presumptuously, and just ask for forgiveness over and over again, and either justify it by calling it a besetting sin, because that's terminology that we tend to use. To say I'm addicted, that sounds too negative as a Christian, but to call it a besetting sin, that terminology sounds a little bit easier to, to digest. Or maybe I call it a struggle. I'm just struggling with this area in my life. But what would happen if I believe what God says in 1 John 3? They that do righteousness are righteous. John says, my little children, don't let anyone deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous. And so yes, the positional righteous, I am in Christ, is critical. Christ covers us. I'm glad that as the Father pities his children, so the Father pities us. And if God were to mark and keep track of our iniquities and sins, the scripture says, which of us would be able to stand? But the same God who covers a multitude of our sins also says, Jesus says in John chapter 4, if you love me, keep my commandments. He that keepeth my commandments is he that loveth me. So I don't know what has happened in our society and in Christendom and in our culture where we've kind of swung, in my opinion, to the other side, where people think that it's okay to overtly, presumptuously, rebelliously disobey God, consciously choose to do wrong, to do evil, intentionally, when God says that, he always gives us a way of an escape when we're tempted. Something has happened, and I believe it's a beguiling and a deception of the evil one that has caused many of God's people to believe it's okay to practice sin, to live in sin, and we have different stages of what it means to live in sin, right? Different ideas of, you know, how many sins do you have, how many of the same type of sin that you need to keep yielding to and giving in, giving into before it becomes either an addiction or it becomes a, um, uh, a something that can control my life and so on and so on. And I do think some of this thinking uh, keeps us in bondage. I know it kept me in bondage. It kept me in bondage because I felt, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm eternally secure in Christ. John 10, no one can pluck me out, nothing, or no one can pluck me out of his hands. And it didn't allow me consciously, maybe a lot of this was unconsciously done, but it didn't allow me to consciously mortify and put to death sin in my life. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, 3 says, mortify and put to death uncleanness. And it gives this list inordinate affection. There's things that we are to mortify and put to death. And as I said in lesson number two or session two, whatever you want to call it, I said in session number two that um, I said in session number two, I just lost my thought for a moment. I thought it was such an important point to make. Um, Holy Spirit, what was that? What was it that I thought was so important to say? Uh, okay, very nice. Uh, it's a little dark out. The sun's not as bright today. Um, 
I, anyway, in Colossians chapter 3, it gives these lists of things that we are to put to death, we're to mortify. Romans chapter Romans chapter 8 says that all that 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 those who are led of the spirit will mortify the deeds of the flesh. We know we're led by the spirit because we desire and we're willing to put to death the deeds of the flesh. So anyway, the point I was making with all of this, I don't remember the point the, the thing I wanted to connect there, maybe later I will is that how we believe about our addictions, bad habits, and again, I'm using it in the, in the sense of things that are sinful, evil, or bad for us. The way we believe about these things has everything to do with the kind of power we'll have to be able to put them to death. I believe that you and I can choose. I think the scripture makes it clear that we can choose righteousness. And... Um, we can choose righteousness. Matter of fact, we're commanded to seek after righteousness. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's ending a section of Matthew 5, where Jesus says, Unless our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, we can't enter the kingdom of God. Now here's what some people do with that text. Here's what some people do with that text. When the Bible says our righteousness has to surpass what the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders in Jesus' day had, what we tend, generally tend to conclude is that just means we need to have Christ's righteousness. Okay, I would agree with that if we say by Christ's righteousness, that means Christ is now living in us and we have the power to choose to do what's right. I believe this is Romans chapter 8. Right? What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemning sin in the flesh, so that we can now live the righteousness of God. Or we can now do what God commands. So I don't believe that Christ died just to make us righteous theoretically. Christ died to give us the power to live righteously. And so, and I believe that's what Romans 8, 1 and 8.4 teaches, it tells us that those who live according to the flesh, as we go on from 5 and following, will die, and these are not the children of God. It says that what the Spirit of God empowers us to do is to live according to the Spirit, to say no to the flesh. So, I hope you found something here that may be practical and helpful. Um, I may continue this on my way home because I don't feel like I said everything I wanted to. But the thing I wanted to get across is you and I must understand the power of addiction and be wise. It is very subtle. It's very crafty. And um, I want to end by reading something from Susanna Wesley. Uh, it's some words she said to her son. She thought, taught her children very young. And I'll pick up on this uh, next time. Uh, she so understood the power to be controlled by things and people that she said, this is what she taught her children. Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley. Um, let's see. Linda said, when you said Eve had the power to choose the right, but chose the wrong fruit, chose the wrong fruit, believing it was good. Uh, not sure what you saying there, Linda, you just said that part. I don't know if you had a question or that was just a comment. Uh, the point I was making there about Eve is Eve, uh, the, 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 it wasn't her lack of ability to choose right. She dis was deceived to believe that what she was choosing was good for her. When she saw that it was good for food, it was desired to make her wise and all the things that the devil had lied to her and promised her. Once she believed that message, the devil was able to to, by deceiving her, by beguiling her through his craftiness and his subtlety, she then made her own free choice, but she made it thinking it was good for her. And the point I was seeking to make is that's kind of how we make decisions. We tend to generally make decisions, even when it's bad decisions, we make them because we, we are promised some sort of benefit. We believe it's going to be temporary pleasure or it's going to fill a void. It's going to satisfy us in some way. And, uh, you know, or something like that. But here is what Susanna Wesley taught her children. She says, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, 
takes off your relish for spiritual things, whatever increases the authority of the body over the mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may seem in itself. This is a woman who understands the power of being addicted to sinful, bad, evil things. She says, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, you're not conscious of God as you should be, takes off your relish for spiritual things, your appetite and affections are now for worldly things, sinful things, then spiritual things. Whatever increases the authority of the body over the mind, you can strengthen the body over the mind. This is why fasting is important, because we weaken the body so that the spirit man becomes stronger. Susanna Wesley taught her children, whatever weakens, whatever strengthens the body over the mind. In American culture, that's a huge problem. Why? God has blessed us with much. We have much food. We have much access, stuff that feed the body. And often the body is much stronger than the soul, than the mind, than the heart. She said, however innocent these things may be, for you, my sons, or my children, to you, this is sin. Anyway, I'm going to end there. i got to run up to an 11 o'clock meeting. I'm already three minutes behind. You guys have a great day. Lord willing, um, I'll probably continue this later because there's more I wanted to say. Uh, and, um, you know, it's a little bit challenging to do it from the car because I don't really have any notes, um, you know, that I can kind of look at. But have a good day, guys. Leave your feedback as usual. Let me know your thoughts. Um, if something didn't make sense, let me know, okay? And if something resonated with you and was helpful, let me know that too. God bless. Bye.